You're very welcome to the Irish Political Roundup with me, Roisin de Cleric. And me, Paul Brophy. On today's episode of the Irish Political Roundup, we'll be covering a, a subject that we have covered here before. And we've also covered uh, both Roisin and myself on our own respective programmes on uh, local radio, that is autism. And of course, we are two years broadcasting on YouTube and it's a subject that we're going to be talking about in more depth and more detail as the, the weeks and months go on. Uh, this evening, we're, we're delighted to be joined by Linda Comerford, who is a disability uh, advocate and activist, and most importantly, uh, a, a mother of two children with um, with autism. Linda has been, would be well known to people within the South, Southeast for her advocacy as part of the Enough is Enough group. Today, we're going to be looking at what happens to um, those children who will be transitioning uh, to adulthood. So once they hit 18, do the services remain um, or do they stop to stop abruptly? Many people with, there are many people out there with living with autism that can live a very independent life. But unfortunately for some, it's not always, that's not always possible. Even simple things like going, going out with your friends, um, going going to the cinema, holding down a job could, could be could be a challenge. And we're going to find out more. Is Ireland doing enough to support autistic people? Uh, Linda, you're very welcome to the Irish Political Roundup. Hi, Paul. Thanks for having me. Hi, Roisin. Hi, Linda. Linda, you've um. You were very, very um active da- down through through the years, uh, with uh, enough is enough uh, campaign. You've kind of, you've taken a little bit of a step a step back, um, but even though you might have taken a step back, the issues that are out there as regards particularly access to services are are still still very much uh, uh, an issue. You know they are. They're very, very much an issue. Um, yeah, I think between COVID and lockdown and everything that kind of knocked the stuffing out of a lot of carers a lot of people across the country um and I know for me because we were still campaigning through COVID and having process that it just I literally just got completely burnt out yeah because as we were kind of saying previously previously um having a conversation it's people hear you on a radio show or on a podcast or they'll see something on the news or in the paper what they're hearing or seeing is a fraction of the work that goes into what you're doing and the advocacy and the research and the meetings and the phone calls and double checking and triple checking your facts to make sure that when you go into meetings and you're you're being direct and you're putting harsh things on the table that you can stand over them. So between that and then obviously with lockdown and, and difficulties that that brought on, um, yeah, I, I took a, a step back. In terms of, I suppose, the national adv- advocating, um, I mean, I'm, all, I'm, I'm still known by HSC here and there for picking up the yeah. phone and advocating on my own behalf, I suppose, or my kids. But um I suppose as a as a, a campaigner who would have been known, I, I've taken a massive step back, but I had to. So um and I think that happens a lot of campaigners, especially if you are campaigning for carers or disabilities as well. It it, it happens a lot of them. It's it's hard to keep going. And yeah, it's, exactly. it's important exactly. to to maintain your own self care as well. Oh, hugely. I mean, if if I'm not okay, then I can't care for the people I'm caring for. So, um, you kind of have to, yeah. And you don't you don't know you're getting burnt out until you're burnt out. Yeah. So it's then it's, it's the picking yourself back up again and realizing. So it's just listen. It happens. Um, but you now I suppose it's happened to me twice. So I don't want it to happen a third time. So, um, it, it's it gets tougher every time to pick up the pieces and pick yourself back up. So, it's. It's now about finding that balance and saying no to things and kind of knowing my own limitations. Because when I do something, I I tend to do it whole hog whole hog. Like I yeah, I don't absolutely. do half measures. I I'm I'm either in or I'm out. Um. So when I'm doing something, I give it my everything. But I literally burned myself into the ground giving it my everything. So, but it, that as as we said earlier, that doesn't mean the issues are not still there. There's still huge problems. There's still many parents and. Um, individuals with disabilities out there tonight who really, really, really need support, who are racking their brains, where do they turn, who do they go to, why are they not being heard? So the issues haven't went anywhere. Carers may get burnt out, people with disabilities may get burnt out advocating, but the issues, unfortunately, we're not burning them away and creating Mm. positive ones, and that's what we need to do. So 
we need to start kind of raising our voices again a little bit and, and pushing for better. What would, be, what would be kind of like the big big issues at the moment? I imagine access to services can, can be a challenge because some parts of the country, um, you know, they might have, there are more services and, and others there, but they may may not be. Does it vary from from county to county or um or is the issue kind of across the board? Yeah, I don't think there's any um I don't think there's any county or area across the country that doesn't have issues. Uh I suppose some of them in terms of weightiness lists and what you can and can access, it, it'll vary a little bit. It is a little bit still of a geographical lot, so even though it's not supposed to be. Yeah. So in terms, but it's, there's not any one area that's functioning appropriately. So and what I mean by that is everything from, from time of birth or time of diagnosis to getting an assessment of need, to getting the early intervention, which we're all told how crucial early intervention is. No one disputing it. We can't get it. Right up to then maybe assessments for school. Is this yeah. child going to be able to um, get a full um, education and social experience in a mainstream school do they need the assistance of a unit do they need a special school um, and then it's all well and good having the recommendations from professionals if you can get that on time trying to get a school place then is another hurdle um, yeah, say I'm, I'm very lucky and I shouldn't have to use the word lucky that my kids are in a local school um, but I was in terms of a place popped up just as we were looking for somewhere for Shauna and she happened to get it. It was a new unit, so there wasn't a huge big waiting list. It had literally only happened. And then as soon as Frankie was due to start, he couldn't start an ASD school for the first year. There was no places and we didn't have his diagnosis in time. Um, so it was senior infants. He went into an ASD class and it was hugely obvious at that stage. He had done a year in primary school that that mainstream wasn't going to be beneficial for him. He was not it just he wasn't going to learn he wasn't going to advance socially or academically in that environment um nice. and that's no fault of the school at the time they did everything they could it just wasn't the right environment for him but then when you get a school place if you do um that there need there needs to be input from psychologists from speech and language from occupational therapy there needs to be engagement with the class teacher the parents yeah. And the therapist, like there, it needs to be if you want this to work, and if we're going to have this holistic approach for the child. And obviously, yeah. if kids are in a school, well, they're there for quite a number of hours, so the teacher needs to know the different things that she would need to know in order to accommodate for that child. So it's yeah, vitally yeah. important that teachers are involved in that process. And again, then ongoing therapies, you're kind of even if you wanted to go private, which no one should have to do. You, you still can't because the public yeah. service is so dire that now the private services, they have become overwhelmed. So they don't even have capacity. And then it's to find when you're going into private, it's like we've seen so much negativity of some private practices that weren't functioning yeah. properly. So it does as a parent make you dubious. Well, who do you go to? Who do you trust? Yeah. What yeah. someone could show me um, their qualifications. That doesn't, doesn't mean anything. I mean, We've seen it on prime time. They can be printed off the internet. So it's well, it's the whole struggle of who do you go to? You're trying to find out from other parents and getting feedback and stuff. So it's everything's a bit like you're constantly running, like you're constantly running just to catch up. And would you say, then, Linda, Linda, sorry for cutting across you there, that when you get into the service, be it public or private, the service you get is good. It's just getting in there is 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 a if, big challenge. If you're getting for in there, um, when you say it's good, I suppose I and I can kind of just go on my own experience and that of my friends on this one and people that you know I speak openly about with this. I would have found in previous years, once you got in, it was very good and it was consistent. I find now it's all getting in means you may get invited to a parent workshop. You may get invited to I don't know, a meeting, a CDNT team, a parent for meeting, and you're told about how long the waitings are and how they're all trying to to work with this, and no one's happy about it and whatever. But it's it's not. I remember when Michael and my, Michael is my eldest son, and I remember when he was getting therapies. We were getting them from a very young age. Some 
Some therapists came to our home, some and they were this was all public, none of this was private. Some came to our home that we happened to live in a in a small town at the time, and that's what they did. They were going some people, others I drove to, some within the county, some outside the county. Um but I was always on the go with therapies, whereas now it's and I always had Michael with me. It was always with the child, whereas now it's always parent only. You, sometimes you might have a group session where there might be some kids in a group, depending on age and depending on what the group is for or what the what therapy they need. But it's it's not CDNT teams were not what they're meant to be. Uh, a lot of them are just teams of half empty teams that don't have yeah. the capacity to meet the needs of the people who are on their waiting lists. And yeah, with all the in the world, a lot of CDNTs are not full function because they haven't full complement of staff no they don't have the staff to do it so I mean you can't as you have a manager she cannot bring in children for a speech and language therapist if she hasn't got a speech and language therapist um, but there doesn't seem to be a huge pushback on why is she not getting these therapists why are they not wanting to come in why are these professionals not wanting to come in and work for the HC what is oh. the problem what the barrier stopping these people coming in for recruitment is it down to um, they just feel so overwhelmed by waiting this. They don't know where to start, where to end. Is it that they're burdened down? We've often heard this by paperwork, and they spend so much time in front of a in front of a laptop or a computer mm-hmm. doing paperwork, where they want to be physically in front of a child. Because I've yet to come across a therapist who wants to sit in an office. That's not what they qualified for. It's not where their passion is. If if it was, they'd be working in something else. So it's th- there's problems everywhere, right up along. Then it's whether you can get a secondary school place. I mean, it's a lot of in primary school. It's a bigger lot of when like the euro millions for secondary school. And then when, the le- when they're 18, they do literally fall off a cliff. Yeah, um, so do, do those services that they've received up to the age of 18, Linda, did they cease? And did they move on to a, n- a more adult kind of setting? Or um, what what happens from not, your own experience? Yeah, adult services are very different because you don't tend to have, like you have CDNT teams, for children's disability services you don't have similar in adults um often you won't even have a therapist in an area so you might not have a psychologist in an area you might not have a senior speech and language therapist so like you can run a waiting list but you're on, on a waiting list for what because there is actually no person there you're told the position is there that's fine that yeah. there's a position there but there's actually no physical therapist there um to complete that so it's you do fall off a cliff. You you you're not given any information. You literally you literally have to search and scrape for information yourself. You you rely heavily. I know I relied heavily on parents who had children older than my son because they had been there before me. They may have yes. come across someone. They may have known someone. So the most information you ever get is usually from parents of children older than your own, adult or, or younger. Um. And you do, you're on waiting. You have to nearly reach crisis point in something to get help. And I've been there where, still there, where I've highlighted certain issues. Oh, till I'm blue in the face over the years. Like, literally, till I get so frustrated listening to my own voice, kind of saying the same thing over and over. And then we've had issues where it has reached really dangerous crisis points. And then when I get really mad, which no one wants yeah. to do when I start shouting, then all of a sudden people hear. And but it's a very reactive. It's like it's like you're closing the stable door after the horse is bolted. And no one can yeah. tell me this is not foreseen because a lot of the time when you reach crisis points, certain things can be foreseen. And if the intervention is put in place, the crisis will never happen. But it's like they don't want to hear you until the crisis happens. And then you're yeah. you're a kind of a team is scrambled together or whatever sport it is, is is kind of scrambled together to the best that people can and what's available. But it's not really always stuck to you have to keep hounding people. You have to be you have to be that annoying person. You have yeah. to be um you have to be a torn in the side. And I, I know I'm known for it. I don't like it. I'm not generally that kind of a person, but I have to be when it comes to HSC and disability services I have to be like that because if I'm not no one else is going to go out there and fight for my kids no one else is going to stand up for them but I do find it has to get to that stage before you're heard and even then even now I still question am I fully being heard um are they really getting 
where what I'm saying. Yes, we've had a crisis. We've had another little crisis. Is it going to take a third one for them to fully listen to me and put the yeah. right things in place? Or am I going to be just repeating myself for years to come? Um, I know recently I attended a meeting and I, I won't say too much about it because I'm not here to talk about any place or person individual. Um, but I attended the meeting and I was surprised. There was a lot of parents older than myself at this meeting. We all have adults with a disability. We're all parents or carers for adults with disability. And they were saying like their, their issues and their problems are the, the same as what mine are. I mean, they're, they're still doing the same thing. But what shocked me was these people were in their 70s and 80s. And they've had these issues for years and years and years. And they've spoke up for years and years and years. I'm not sitting here for one second thinking that I'm the only person to ever speak up. There has been money before me and there'll be money after me. Yeah. But it frightened me to think that I can get to 80 or 90 years of age and I'm still going to be having the same battles. And I'm still going to be uh, knocking on the HSD's door, wanting to know like where certain services are, why people are not getting services, why we're promised one thing and then it's ripped from under us and... Or they, the government decide they're going to have this holy grail of services and they change stuff around and it usually makes it worse instead of better. Um, and that can be seen across the board because even if you look at the statistics in families who are now taking legal action, um, especially when it comes to assessments and needs and, and things like that, the numbers are staggering. The numbers are climbing and climbing and climbing. Now, those parents have better things to be doing with their time and with their finances than having oh, yeah. to take the HSE to court. But that's what they're having to do. The HSC tried to come back at that and change the whole standard operating procedure of AON. No one listened to us when we said it first. All of a sudden, it became really clear that we weren't, and when I say we, I'm going to add parents and advocates, that we weren't kind of just making noise about nothing, that there was something not right here. And then all of a sudden, it was stopped and it was put on hold. But the HSC then, Again, they try to change it all where it's like a tabletop assessment before you actually get approved for assessment. And yeah. a, a problem I often had with that was that like, if you're a parent and you're filling in a form, there's loads of things I'll notice about my child and difficulties that my child will have, and I can write them down. But I don't have the eye of a therapist to cop certain things. And there's certain things, even with my youngest, that I wouldn't have seen that was only brought to my attention afterwards on top of other things they've gone on no one takes into account am i a parent with a disability mm. have i the ability to accurately fill in that form and give the best representation good bad or indifferent of my child and if no one has asked that and they're taking a form that may not have the complete information on it mm. then they're deeming oh no this child actually doesn't need an assessment of need and they put that form to the side okay it's like it's like it's a provisional assessment before your assessment, but no one's actually it's it's all just ticking boxes. Yeah. No one's actually sitting down and talking to you like they would have done. Yeah. Historically, I remember yeah. Mikey was twenty three this year in October, at the end of at the start of October, and I can remember twenty years ago sitting down with therapists, with schools, with people, and it was all very much we were all on the one page. Now it's I'm giving forms and I'm asked to tick boxes. Yeah. And you, there's no conversation. You, you cannot know about someone from looking at a list of ticked boxes. You only get a certain amount from that. You get the most from actually talking to a parent. And nine times out of ten, the m most information they will get, a parent won't even realise that they've said it. Could be something simple that they said, oh God, this was a difficulty that I mightn't think is a huge thing, but a therapist it will register in their head. And they say, oh, and then that would prompt them to ask more questions. You, you don't have that anymore because you don't have the personal one-to-one -one anymore. Yeah. I've often said, have we become a, just a box-ticking society? And um, I think, this, sorry, I'm walking around for a second. You're fine, Linda. You know, have we just become that box-ticking society that people, and, and and especially people, vulnerable people, exactly as you said, Linda, is just a box checking exercise. But everything is, it's like from from looking for an assessment, applying for home support, looking for respite, 
for school places, everything is a box ticking exercise. Everything. If you're in a school and your child needs an EPS assessment or they need support of a therapist, again, it's a load of form filling. It's like the amount of form filling. And then like when a child goes to school, you fill in a load of forms for teacher because obviously the teachers need to get to know your child, what they like, what they don't mm. like, whatever, in order for them. But it just, it literally, sometimes you can feel very, very overwhelmed in a mountain of paperwork. And a lot of it is repetitive, even though those people may not have that information before. I often feel like I'm filling out the same things over and over and over and over and over for all these different people. That it's It's very monotonous. It's very robotic. It's not pleasant as a parent to have to sit down in front of a farm and write all this negative stuff about your child. Because as much as there's difficulties and there's negative stuff, there is an ocean of good things. Absolutely. So, so it can be very demoralizing and it can yeah. it can be very hard sometimes. So it, it can leave you feeling very low afterwards or it can feel you leaving a bit maybe anxious afterwards. Um, yeah. And I don't think any of that is ever taken into consideration for parents who have to fill in those type of forms. Um, and I know they're a necessary evil, but it's gone to a crazy extent at the minute. Like it literally, I don't ever remember as much paperwork when Michael was the age that my younger kids are now. I don't ever remember it. And he would have been getting a lot more one-on-one therapies I would have been on the go a lot more because there is no therapies now um and I still don't remember as much paperwork there was always some not to the extent that there is now it just seems to be all paperwork now um and I just yeah you kind of wonder I'm writing all this stuff down but I'm not getting the help or the support my child is still facing the same difficulties they're still having the same struggles yeah. so what am I doing it for and it's taken that human interaction, that sense of human care out of it. You feel like you're just talking either to in an email, a computer, or just paperwork instead of that human side of what is happening. Yeah, it is. There is no human side anymore. And a lot of the times, like when you go into a, a therapist and you're talking about your child and, and they might be giving you helps or tips. I'm not a therapist. I can go to as many workshops as they want, parenting courses and God knows what else. I'm still not a therapist. Yeah. That one-on-one, when your child is there and you can physically see what the therapist is doing, you can see their interaction. That's vital in order for you to then be able to go home and fulfill that program, whatever program yeah. they've given you to do with your child. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Because if you're not shown, you're not going to know. No. And it doesn't matter how many years I'm a carer, or how many children I have, I'm still not a therapist. I'm a parent. Um, and I do the best I can. But again, that's limited when you're not the therapist. So you, you, like we have, if they want, like, I was, if they want, like a lot of the time before you would have got blocks of sessions where you would have went in and the therapist was doing a lot of the work. Um, and then you'd go home, you'd have a home program soon, go back again. Whereas now it's kind of majority of it's at home. Um, you can't do that accurately unless you're shown how. Unless you have constant check-ins and you have people checking, are you doing this right? Have you maybe yeah. have I slipped on something and I've have I started doing something wrong that's now going to be picked up by the child and then it's going to be harder to correct? You're not. Yeah. There's no follow-on care. There's no continuity. There's no consistency. There's no. There's no sense of feeling support by a team because and when I mentioned the team before, like with Michael. I always knew who all the different therapists were. We all knew each other. We knew each other. Our, our faces were sitting down. We were talking. I couldn't tell you who half the therapists are in there now because there's none for some things. And the ones who do come in don't tend to stay too long. Um, there was a constant fluctuation and, and turnover of staff. So either you have no staff to get to know or the turnover is that high that you just, you don't get to know them because you don't get to see them enough to know them. But it's like you could see someone this year and then or this month and six months time it could be someone different in that position yeah I think we probably said it before Linda when when you have a child with an additional need you learn to be an advocate or politician very 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 quickly I I'd say you're amazed it's amazing talking to you as well on yeah. uh, the amount of information that that you have that you've been able to share with uh, other parents and what a lot of stuff you probably learned on the fly as well which is which is which is uh, uh f- f- phenomenal so it that is 
one thing I see anyway, it's that ever from the day they're born to maybe to do, it's always battle, 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 battle. And that must, um, that can be draining, I, I can imagine. It is. It is it's very draining because it's it's never any one thing. It's never any one person. Um, and I think whether you have one child, I think it's obviously it's going to get more difficult the more kids you have Um, in terms of the amount of people you have to communicate with. And I think that's what some of the therapists forget as well is that if you, that you're not, even if you've only got one child, you're not just dealing with one therapist. You're dealing with multiple people. Um, and where there used to be the whole multidisciplinary approach, that it doesn't seem to be there anymore. Um, or if it is, it's tin on the ground. It's very, very tin on the ground. There's very few parents I know of who would have that multidisciplinary support whereby everyone comes together in the one room. So whether it's your, your speech and language therapist, your parent, your social worker, your whatever, whoever else you need. And we all sit down around the table and we all discuss what the child needs, where they're at, what's working, what's not working um, and how the family are. Like, yeah. how are the family coping? Is everything else at, at home? Yeah. How, are, how are siblings coping? You don't, no one knows that anymore, but un- unless you're the type of parent who's going to actually say it, listen, it's not great at the minute, and you're going to pick up the phone, and you're going to put you're going to have to keep doing it, and keep doing it. You nearly feel like you're begging to be heard, and you're begging for support. Um, It's not an easy thing to do, and it's certainly not a thing a lot of parents find easy to do, which is why we have so many parents struggling at home. Um, because it's just a lot of it. It's like, what's the point? They just don't feel heard. They don't feel that never changes. They don't feel your email and you're you're ringing people and you're not getting emails back. You're not getting phone calls back, or you're told you're told you're on a list, or you're told oh you're sent a work to a workshop, or you know it just it it's it. I don't think I've ever seen it as bad as it is at the minute, yeah. and across across the board from children's services and into adult services and yeah adult services is a whole other yeah field and um, and it is is amazing that the health service spend its the highest it's ever been in the history of the state right. and it's still there are a lot, a lot of parents out there which would share your what your your feeling exactly it is and even when when your adult child goes to a day service um, if that's the appropriate thing that they need to do and go to a day service and need that support. There's so many, while there's good things in day services, and I'm certainly not here pointing the finger saying they're all bad, there's, there's a lot of room for improvement. There's mega room for improvement. Um, I think we've let things in this country slip massively. Mm. And I'm not going to be popular for saying this, but I think a lot of day services have become glorifying um, babysitting services where they're yeah. we're told that the young person has choice and we're following new directions and there's lots of positive things in new directions um mm-hmm. so I would welcome that but it's what you're telling me you're doing what you're writing on a piece of paper and what's actually been done and the reason it's been done are very different very very different um and especially since COVID especially yeah. since COVID um day services must, are not the same. that must have they been must. extreme extremely difficult with day service closing and if you say your children or adults with autism routine is massive and during COVID the whole routine was just completely obliterated with um, you know day services. It was a horrendous time for the young people themselves because some of them some of them may have known and been able to understand what COVID was but still maybe were fearful of it and, and not okay with the fact that they had to leave their day service and then you had those who didn't really understand what COVID was, couldn't understand why they weren't allowed to go to their day service or their, their usual sporting activities or whatever social things they normally go to. Everything was shut down. And I think everyone found that hard. So you can imagine that if you're someone who has a disability who doesn't have the understanding that we had mm-hmm. or didn't have the rationale that we had, whether we liked it or not, we were able to comprehend, we were able to follow what's happening. If you if you don't if you if you have a, a difficulty in that area and you can't um understand what COVID is and you can't make sense of what's happening on the news every night and following things, I can only imagine how scary that can be for someone. And then you you're hearing because everyone acted differently, whether they say they did or not, they did. Everyone was more cautious. There's people I knew 
that I would never have thought were nervous people became extremely nervous people. Um, so I've seen lots of change, lots of different people. And that was picked up upon not being able to go anywhere, everything being at home, everything intensified. I know it was a hugely difficult time in my home, and I, but I also know it was a huge difficult time in many homes across this country. Um, certainly, I don't ever, ever want to come across a lockdown again um, or anything to happen where services are just completely halted, where someone's life is completely halted like that, because it just... We're still feeling the effects of COVID. Like, it's Absolutely. mad. I said to someone recently, it's like most people don't think about COVID now or they don't, you know, it's mm. just, it, that was a thing in the past and we don't think too much about it anymore. But fa- but a lot of carers of elderly people or carers of people with disabilities and people with disabilities themselves are still feeling the impacts of COVID. And that's not ever really spoken about or considered or... People might look at me strange and go, so COVID was a long time ago, what are you going on about? The trauma it caused so many people. Yeah. That that doesn't just go away. That yeah. doesn't go away. And when you're not getting the right supports and you're not getting the right professionals on at the right time, or you're getting them later, it, it like it causes a severe, a severe amount of damage to people emotionally, um, in in cognitively in lots of different ways. Skills that we had were lost. People maybe who weren't aggressive all of a sudden became very, very aggressive. Um and it yeah, it, it, it became like really, really difficult for a lot of families. Um and as I say, COVID might be gone, but the effects of that are still being felt while things are better. The effects are still being felt by many people. Um I think be, I think the effects will be felt for a long, long time to time mm. to come, maybe a couple of decades. I might mm. sound extreme saying that, but I def, def I would definitely agree with everything you're saying. Yeah, no, I think the the effects of it are hugely significant, but not nearly enough recognised or spoken about. Um, I think everyone thought if we open services back up and we open the sporting clubs back up and the social activities back up, and sure, they'll be grand. Sure, they'll come back in now. They'll love seeing their friends, and it'll be great not as easy as that like we live in the real world it's never as simple as that it's not as simple as that for me or you if we have difficulties what makes it so simple for these guys I mean it it just isn't like that and I think sometimes we can we look sometimes I often think these people who make decisions they I don't know do they see a number is person with disability just a saying to them or do they actually realize that it's a person and are they ticking a box and going, okay, that person is in a day service. That that box is ticked for him. Um, yeah, he's on a waiting list for that. So that box is ticked, and we can squeeze in a bit of respite there. So that box is ticked. And it's like these people are only supposed to live from eight o'clock in the morning to maybe six o'clock in the evening. And if you say to someone, well, what if they want to socialize to meet new people? What if they want to go to the pub? and have a pint and watch the match, or have their dinner out at half seven. They don't get to do that. Mm. And I challenge any day service or any residential service to tell me that these people are living full lives and are not constricted in any way, because they're not. And we t- there was the whole big um, thing at the time of decongregation, and I remember arguing yeah. with Finney McGrath, who was a den minister, and it was all about the one word that used to annoy me was institution. And it was like people looked at this building or a home or a communal residential area as an institution. And like I was saying, the building is not the institution. The attitude to how the building is run is the institution. We never needed to change the buildings. We needed to change attitudes. And it's the same now. You can t- you can have a a communal residential area where there's 25 young people living and you can take them out and move them into the community and you have three of them living in a house here if there's no one if there's no car at that house so this is semi-independent living where there's there's, there's carers in the house there's no car at that house to bring that young person somewhere then you're institutionalizing them because they can't go somewhere independently on their own the staff's most likely probably can't leave because there's more than one person in the house. So if they leave, then who's going to stay with the other person? There's no car there. 
most of these young people are in bed eight, nine o'clock at night. Not by choice. It's become a routine. I don't, like, it's, I don't know. And it's like, I often say, like, it's it's easy. It's it's easy as a parent. Well, not that it's easy as a parent. So it's, it's, it's easier to highlight the difficulties. When I think some people who are in these positions don't see the problem of what's happening. And it's not because they're not good people or they're not nice people. They just don't see the problem or they don't see that. It's almost like, sure, sure, what would a person with a disability be going out for? Where would they be going? I've had that said to me when I brought this up at my own son. Where would he be going? I'm like, wherever he'd want to go. I thought we lived in a world where he has free choice and autonomy mm. and whatever. Okay. Like. These are all buzzwords because in yeah. the real world, yeah. 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 the world I'm living in, this doesn't happen. And yeah. I love TVs and I could have HSE managers and I'm sure CEOs of day services tell me that I am wrong. But when they're telling me that I'm wrong, they know in their heart of hearts that I'm not, but they just won't admit it. And it's like just yeah. a culture, a lackadaisy culture after taking over. There's like, as I say, institutions are not the buildings. It's the attitude. And until we change the attitudes, yeah. we're not going to change anything. Exactly. Not gonna yeah, that's, that's that's a good good point because I'd say that they asked me what's the take home of the program. Definitely that the buildings are not the institution. It's it's yeah. the mind it's the mindset and the attitudes within the yeah. within the building that, that make it a, make it a, an institution. And yeah. um, Linda, we asked you on uh, primarily to talk about autism, and, and you would have a, a fair experience of that being uh, being being a parent of two children who. Who um who are autistic? They say if you met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. But um, it does even though you have two two children with with uh, with autism, um, it affects them. I imagine in different ways. Yeah, I mean, Sean and Frankie, my youngest two, they couldn't be any any more different. They have a similar diagnosis, but they're like chalk and cheese. And I suppose, um, how they're affected would be or the different struggles they would have would be very, very different. So like my daughter would have huge issues with anxiety. Um, as I say, she's PDA. For anyone who doesn't know that, it's pathological demand avoidance. So there would be no reason why Shauna couldn't, if you asked her to pick up the green ball and throw it in the green box, there is no reason physically or cognitively why she, why she can't do that. But for whatever way people that have PDA, whatever way their, their brains work, that you put that demand, they see that as a demand. You're telling them to put a particular thing in, in a particular box. So it's a demand. And it's like their brain goes into panic, their anxiety comes up. Mm-hmm. Um, Sean would either bolt, have a meltdown, she could become aggressive, she could become um tearful. Tearful is I suppose the newer way. Aggressive and flight risk was when she was younger. Now it's more um anxiety and tearfulness and up, being really upset but not knowing why she's upset and then getting frustrated with herself um so that and that eats into everything people often say to me Asher we all get a bit like that now again she's only she's only growing up it's only stages of growing up and whatever and I'm like it, it impacts every part of her life in ways that I'm not going to explain to every pe- person I meet because yeah. they don't all need to know it I mean my daughter is entitled to her privacy and her dignity um so a lot of that's not seen but it's like it impacts her in, yeah in so many ways and that's hard for any parent then to deal with and I suppose when it, we're heading to the stage now where Sean is getting of an age where we're going to be coming into puberty and hormone changes and I'm sure that's yeah. going to be a barrel of laughs I can't wait um we'll see if all that to look forward to then on top of the anxiety as well and I suppose especially in I don't know it seems to be different for girls now when they're growing up as well um mm. I just be with my own daughter. She's just very, very conscious of what other people are doing. Very conscious of, um, even even social media. When I said I mean kids YouTube and different YouTubers that are on it and stuff and what's happening. And yeah, I just find she's Sean. I know she's autism. She would tell you she has autism. Um, but I find the older she gets, I suppose she's asking a lot more questions. So we, I suppose my thing has always been, I'll answer whatever questions you have age appropriately is. All she get was it's never been a secret in this house. Disabilities are never been spoken openly about. Um, for Frankie, he's a, he's younger than Shauna. He's a lot shyer, a lot quieter by nature. 
Um, yeah. He wouldn't have anxiety, but I suppose not to the extent to Sean or anyway, but I suppose would find emotional regulation difficult. Would be a bit more delayed um, academically. Doesn't have an intellectual disability, but is delayed academically and and socially. And that I would say as well, he just that little bit more behind. Um, and Shire, as I say as well, so it's yeah, he's a, he would struggle to pick up different things. So even like in schools, so things like correctly holding a pencil, being able to write, these are all things that he would find incredibly difficult. So I need to find motor skills, things like that. Yeah. And then his, he wouldn't be the most confident child. So we're we're working on that as well to build the our confidence. Um, but again, the two of them are like chalk and cheese. Um, yeah. Frankie would be a lot do a lot of food. He's a very he has aversions to so he won't eat particular foods because of the smell or the taste um or the texture or he it could be something that he ate last week and he might never eat again um that, yeah, just just so many foods and even in the last six months alone I'm kind of struggling going like, if, you, if you give up anything else if you stop eating anything else I actually don't know what I'm going to feed you like you, you we're, we're we're down to that limited kind of selection now so it's like what yeah, am I actually yeah. going to feed you um Shauna would be not as bad with food. Like she is picky, but I suppose not to the same extent as Frankie. And it's not, I shouldn't use the word picky. It's not that they're picky. I suppose it's just the different sensory issues that they have around food. Yeah, yeah. Um. So it's, yeah, it's, I don't know. Like sometimes I, I don't think I realise how hectic and different things are. Like I could be cooking three different dinners. I, I, I kind of don't think about it anymore. Um. Because there's no point in cooking one. I mean, I can like people say, she just cook the one dinner and put in front of them. If they're hungry, they'll eat it. Mm-hmm. Child with autism will not eat a food that they have a sensory aversion to. They just what they will yeah. starve. They will physically starve. Um, and people don't believe me on that, and they don't have to. But I'm not going to starve my child. I know what's going to happen, so I'm not going to starve them. So it's yeah, they're they're, they're so different. And even I think of my friends' kids. I can think of neighbors' kids. They all have similar diagnosis, but they're all so different. Some yeah. are like would have difficulties that would impact every aspect of their daily living, mm-hmm. and they would need um significant support with all, with all, everything that they need to do. Um, while then you have others maybe who are can do certain things independently, but are impacted in other ways. So it's like it's they're like trees. Every every one of them is a different branch, a different leaf. They're all unique. So. And Lindy, do you think, do you think our, overall people's awareness of autism has has improved say, in the last um, last ten fifteen years? You know, um, um, we've seen like you know we have, we have lots of different organisations coming forward, kind of you know promoting you know autism awareness, and uh, there's diff- different initiatives within. Even if you go to say your local, some of your su- local supermarkets, like they have autism shop shopping hour, uh, and and things like that. Do you think we're becoming a bit more conscious and and aware of people with, with autism? And are there are there is there improvements in our understanding, or do we still have a bit to go? Cool. Loser. Maybe something happened to remember we said if and if the children come in or something. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe absolutely. she put that off. Yeah. But Paul, you know, it's it's you know, I'll speak from that point of view. I often wonder if it just um PR where people say, Oh, yeah. we're autism friendly, we're mm. we're disability friendly. You yeah. know, is that really a real value of a company of business? Is yeah. all this is the question I'm asking now? Is it mm. all just a lot of um ticking the box exercises? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I think it's something that has to be asked a big question. Hundred percent. As Nicholas, where's all the money going? Where, as, where's the where's the the benefits of all this money going? Then you have a lot not, it has to go to the end. It has to go to the people living with autism, and yeah, not with more campaigns, more this and more that. Yeah, yeah. If it's not going to the people that need it, then it's not a success. And a lot of these places, they said, are very inclusive and all this. And but when you try do something, they're going, "Well, I don't know about that." Well, your policy says, "Well, the policy, blah blah blah." You know, you're like, has it become so politically correct? And yeah. so P- over PR'd that 
nothing actually happens. But it's all just on paper, marketed, and a tick in the box exercise. Tick the box, kick the can down the road. Yeah. Mm. Because speaking to Linda, yeah. It doesn't seem to be saying, as you mentioned, that the amount of money that has been put put aside and invested into disability yeah. or autism or anything, it yeah. doesn't seem to be reaching the people who need it. No, no. So we have boats that can't fill, you know. And like, if you're, say, you have a child and they're doing working with a therapist, like they need to build up a rapport and stuff like that. Like, your therapist is moving on every, changing every a trust, yeah, yeah. And that rapport, that relationship, especially yeah. now, you know, I'm I'm making an assumption here, but with mm. somebody with autism or disability, it takes a lot of time. As you talked about the routine, the routine yeah. of having the same person, the same trust, the same people that you yeah. know who know you. And yeah, absolutely. Like, what, as Lynn just said, the different branches, everyone, and as what you said, you know, everybody with autism, if you meet one person with autism, that's one person with autism. Yeah, it, is. it affects people in, in, in different ways. And that relationship when you build up with a therapist, mm. and even just someone at reception of someone, yeah. you oh, know. Yes. I'd always, like, yeah, at reception a good bit of times, and I'd always try to be present and help someone and stuff like that. And you get right. to know. It's like trust okay. and knowing if you phone up, you phone yeah. somewhere, that, that you are t- treated as a human being. Oh, yeah, yeah. And treated with the respect and dignity mm. that you that is expected of um yeah. a um of someone, of a mother phoning up. Yeah. Here's Linda now. Inception. I think some some of our conversation here, if we could keep that in Russian, that would be brilliant. Well, I say I'm going to keep it all in, Paul, even this oh, yeah. chat that we're having. Oh, brilliant, brilliant. So it's, it's yeah. really, I think, I mean, I'm in tears here listening to yeah. Linda. I know Linda's coming back. I'm in tears here listening to Linda and completely, oh, my God, you know. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm can hard, you hear me? We can hear yeah, you, yeah. Linda, yeah. We can mm. hear you. can hear you, but we can't see you. Oh, we oh, can, can hear you as well, Linda. All right. Linda, Sorry about that. My internet's acting up and cut me off. No Don't worry, Linda. We're just so grateful. I'm just saying to Paul, like I'm sitting in here in tears mm. at listening to the heartache and the, the the lack of dignity and respect that 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 you know that even you as a mother when you're filling out the forms, filling out paperwork, trying to phone up. And all this money that is being in, apparently invested is not reaching the 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 the, the purpose and intention of what the money is being invested for, and that is the carers and more importantly the the children or young adults with disabilities or autism. That's the one thing we often say is that we're told. Come up, especially we'll hear it in the, in the weeks come up to the budget, and oh. I'm sure we'll hear Minister Rabbit coming out, and she's excellent. But just, but it, we, it's never felt on the ground. It is yeah. never felt on the ground. So all the, all the figures that they throw at us, whether it's about whether it's in monetary terms, and all the hundreds of thousands of euros that we spend in our pumping in system, or whether it's that they're recruiting more people. I'd love to see where all these people they're recruiting are, because if they're Every year we're told about how they're recruiting more and more people. Where are they? Because we have no services and we wouldn't keep ask confirm if we had them. You wouldn't hear parents. No parent wants to do like no parent wants to be on prime time. No parent wants to be on the front of the paper. No parent really wants to be on the radio. No one like no one in our offense intended. Talking about these things. We yeah. shouldn't have to be. I should be able to be living here with my kids, bring them to appointments where their needs are met or having a programme here at home that I'm supported in delivering to have their needs met. No one would hear from me. No one would know. Why would they need to know? We don't want to be putting our private lives out there. But often you literally come to the end of the road and you're like, what else can I do? Where else do I turn? How worse does something have to get before someone's going to hear me? And 
it was funny. I, I remember back at, well, it's not funny really, but I remember back at the beginning of Enough is Enough. And it was, I think after one of the first meetings, I don't even think it was the first protest. I think it was after one of the first meetings that we'd had with a minister. Three members, at the time there was there was a lot more of us at the very beginning, but three members were hand-delivered letters with appointments by HSC. Right. Now, I don't know many people who are hand-delivered appointments for the HSC. And I wouldn't have believed it if I didn't know these people and I hadn't seen it for myself. And it was like, but it was an attempt. It was the same as when I spoke to a previous minister. And he didn't, he wanted to focus just on me and my children. He didn't want to hear about the problems in schools or problems in services or problems of access and services. He wanted to fix my problem and shut me up so I could go away. And it's like, it's the same with hand delivering those letters. Give her what she wants and she'll go away. Give him what he wants and she'll go away. When the knife settles, just the rest of them will all just fall, fall away. Like. Yeah. And they, people think I'm mad for thinking this, but this is lit- like, I've lived this. I see it. This is what goes on. And it's like, it's like they make a game out of it. And this is not a game. This is my life as a carer and a mother. This is my children's lives. Yes, it's really. like it's not a game, but I often feel we're just sorry. I know I'm I'm very dark here. Um, it often it feels like we're we're kind of given the run around. We're treated like we don't know what we're talking about or what. Should, why are you looking for that? It's, it's yeah, you're you're not you're not treated well as a carer in this country. I don't think I don't think you'll have any carers coming on who will tell you otherwise. Um, I'd be more than shocked. I'd imagine they're few and far between if they do exist. Yeah. Which is terrible because you're, you're saying you're not, they billions. They don't care. They they don't care. They And I say that myself, they do, but they don't. I think successive governments, successive TVs, successive ministers have shown, and uh, government ministers that and government TVs have shown if the willpower was there and if the want was there to make things better, they would do it. The government could, if they wanted, in the morning, ratify the optional protocol for the UNCRPD. They won't. And they'll they'll talk and they'll flaunt and they'll wave the flag of, oh, but we ratify the UNCRPD. It is completely toothless without the optional protocol because nobody in this country can make a complaint. Yeah. And mm-hmm. if we do make complaints, the government... I remember saying to a minister one time, are ye afraid that if you ratify that, all of a sudden, not only will there be complaints, there will be a lot of legal cases and it would absolutely cripple the country. And I said, that's exactly what we're afraid of. But they're never going to go on record and say that. They're never going to admit that they admitted that to me. But I cannot think of any other reason why this government have not ratified that. They have had years to plan it. They have had years to change whatever legislation needed to be changed. They had years to implement whatever policies needed to be implemented. The will is not there. The want is not there because they do not care. If you're a carer or a person with a disability in this country, and I add people who are down there look into that because I think they're also overlooked. You're not cared about in this country. You're not. It's proven. They, they deemed during COVID that anyone who lost their job needed a minimum of 350 euro to live a minimum well i'm a full-time carer and i can tell you my carer's allowance is not 350 euro so if that's the minimum you need to live and if carers are saving the state millions why are we paid pittance when we're the only people on social welfare who actually work for our money and we don't clock in and we don't clock out and we won't get to retire I'll be a carer till the day that I get into my grave. Where's where's the care back from the government? Because I'm not feeling it. I think we've just started this conversation with getting to the core of it now again. Linda, when you used to come on the radio, as when many people say, when someone has something of value to say, people listen. I know when you came on the radio, Every presenter and every listener 
listen to you. And I know I'm speaking for you, Paul, there too. Absolutely. Please, uh, please. I mean, I'm sitting here thinking, oh, my God, I just want to cry. And it's not even my child, my life. And I'm going, how many, the amount of women, that, mothers that I know are mothers to children with, with disabilities or autism. And as you said, you don't clock in, you don't clock out. And it's, but who support, who heals the healer? Who supports yeah. the carer? Who cares for the carer? That's another question, you know, that I'm thinking, I'm listening to you. And I'm going, who's there for you, Linda, when you're there for your three children? Mm. And we haven't even touched on, you know, if we haven't even scratched the surface. We haven't, but we've just got to the top of it and going back down. But we need to start this campaign here on the Irish Public Around of and Confident Women Island. And we need to get this, make somehow make this a campaign as well. Mm. With the best that we can uh, using our our platforms and our channels. It is what I think the more the more people that have these conversations, the more people who get involved in the conversations, okay. the more people. There's a huge one thing that I've noticed. Um, I've noticed about a lot of parents. I used to only notice it of parents with adult children, but I have started seeing it from parents of younger children. Some of them are afraid to speak up because they're afraid of what little services they have will be taken away. And it's like, oh, well, are you not? It's like, remember one parent said to me, she rang up, um, her child needed three different therapies. So three different professionals were needed. They were semi-receiving one of the services, not receiving the other two. And they were basically, the parent obviously was ringing up saying, listen, what's the story? Where are we on the waiting list? How much longer will we be waiting? We're getting X, Y, and Z difficulties. And they're basically told, we're giving you what we can give you. Is that not enough for you? Do you not want that? That mother never said she didn't want that ter- that service. Yeah. But her child had more than one need. So what is she supposed to do? Is she, like, as parents, are we supposed to kind of say, okay, you have three needs. Listen, we'll forget about two of them and we'll just focus on one. It sure. doesn't matter that you're never going to progress in the other two. Like, that's, that's the attitude you're up against. Like, it's... The parents are afraid to speak up. A lot of back to the institution. Again, it was a lot of the last day. There was a lot of parents... There was one elderly parent who was telling me something she wasn't happy about. It was at this meeting I was telling you about. And as soon as someone who could do something about her issue came to the table, she didn't speak. She didn't say anything about it. And I asked her why afterwards when that person had left. And she said, oh, sure. he take away the bit I have. And I remember walking out and thinking... That woman should go to bed at night and not have a worry. She's lived her life. This woman was 84. She's lived her life. She's worked hard. She's cared all her life. And she's afraid to say something in case the little, little bit she has is taken off her. And I don't know how bad have we got as a country. Silence. But we have elderly people who shouldn't even still be full-time carers but have oh. no other option to be. Because there is no residential um, houses for a lot of people. Um, and she's afraid to speak up and she goes to bed with those worries every night. And I was like, and again, it's it's like looking into a mirror sometimes. It's like, that's going to be me. I can, yeah. am I, like, unless something really drastically changes, that is me. That's yeah. a scary mirror to look into. Yeah. As much as I admire that woman, she's a strong woman, she's by God, she's done her best through the years. That was a scary mirror to look into. Mm. That's you often leave these meetings. People say, "Oh, how did the meeting go?" Or, "Do you know what there was that brought up?" No one talks. We talk about the things that happen and the things that are said, but we don't talk about the feelings that you have when you walk away, or maybe thoughts that have been provoked at those meetings that, that are going to keep you awake that night. They're not the things we talk about. Because again, that's what keeps me awake. What keeps me awake is not going to help my children struggle. So I'll talk about my kids' struggles and I'm not going to be talking about what keeps me awake. But it is quite frightening. It is really frightening. And I hope and pray, hope and pray that we see some sort of dramatic change in this country. 
and the sooner the better. But I do fear, and this is a genuine, real fear, that I won't see that change in my lifetime. Wow, that's a big... And that's scary because of I'm not an old person. I'm 43 in October. So I don't class myself as being old. Um, and to know that that amount of families are just not going to get any help and things are not going to get any better is quite frightening. But the government haven't done anything in the last 10, 15 years to make me confident that anything will change. I'm speechless, I don't know about you. I'm speechless and I'm, yeah, and it takes a lot to get me speechless, as you both know, but I'm completely flabbergasted, speechless and overwhelmed with just listening because, it's, you know, when you, mm. you have, and we hear the I for look around, but we care about who we interview. We care mm. what topics that we talk about. Because it's usually the mm. topic that no one else is talking about, which is really the, at the heart of the matter. Linda, right. you're going to be on with us regularly, and we have, we just want you to know that we're here for you. We're here with you as much as what we can, but know that any, we're here for any time you want to highlight anything or say anything or get the word out there. Um, we would like to start a campaign and um, have you on with this with us for this campaign so we can do what little we can do to help people with disabilities and mothers and carers and families and the people living with disabilities and autism. We want to do what little we can do and help on our wee small platform. Oh, well, it's my thing, Annie. As I said already, any conversations that can be had, anything that can be highlighted, um, and the and the positive as well. I'm like, yeah. I'd love if something positive happens, and we can come on and we can say, God, yeah. isn't this great? I, I I certainly don't want to be, or I don't like being the person who has yeah. negative stuff to say all the time, bad stuff to say all the time. I really, really, really hope and pray for the day where I come on and say, like, isn't this amazing? Even if it's just something small. Mm. Once it's something tangible and it's something that can be felt on the ground, we I'll I'll start celebrating when I see change. I won't celebrate too hard too soon. Mm. I might have a little bit here, um, mm. but I I relish the day where we can come on and say, "Isn't this amazing? Look how this has changed. Look how much better this is. Why have we not done this sooner?" Um, yeah. So so ho hopefully throughout the course of it, um, while we're highlighting some of the not so positive hopefully some positive will happen in the meantime in throughout as well and we can yeah celebrate where necessary because i think we have to we have to try look for some of the good as well because Absolutely. too hard otherwise yeah too and hard. There's, there's a lot of great people out there like yourselves who are you know doing phenomenal work you know advocating for for their for their for their children and there's also you know um, people working in these services who are doing savage work and unfortunately at times they feel they're kind of the system kind of uh, uh, has them constrained they feel like they're working with their hands right behind their back and that's probably why there's a lot of people um, why there's a, such a turnover of, of staff there's a lot of staff getting frust frustrated with the it's institute report, it's about where is the money going yeah, where is the, the money is not going to the people that need it and that is evident. Yeah. But I think even just to go back to Paul's point there, and he made a really good point, and one that I would strongly advocate for as well, is the staff that look after our children, whether they be teachers, SNAs, or therapists, or otherwise, they need to be adequately supported and yeah. funded as well. And even, even if you look at, I mean, most um, adult day services, whether they're for people with intellectual disabilities or people with autism, um, Sorry, I swear I'm telling you, I'm a, I'm a mom here with disabilities who's also going through menopause and getting brain fog and forgetting what I'm saying half of the sentence. But a lot of these, that's what I said, a lot of these day services are staffed by Section 39 workers. Yep. They are not paid the same as HSE staff. So a lot of the time you will have two people doing the same job, but on two very different wages and two very different terms and conditions. And until we look at 
improving conditions for Section 39 workers, which has long been in the pipeline. I remember it was one of the first meetings I went to was in Liberty Hall with SIP2 and they were calling for a change, for a uh, positive change for Section 39 workers. Um, and I remember being at that and thinking, it's uh, yeah, I want the services there. And yes, I want the supports for my children, but I want them to be adequate. I don't just want the Timu services. I want our staff who are trained, who are adequately supported, who are adequately resourced um, and who are paid accordingly. They're doing a job. They're looking after some of the most, pre- like m- my precious people. My my children are the most precious people to me. These people are looking after them. They're providing care to them. They're providing the supports that they need. They deserve to be paid for that. And at the mm-hmm. moment, they're trun crumbs and they're given mm-hmm. awful work conditions and they're not respected and they're not appreciated. And that has to be, that has to change as well. But it's back to the point of I don't think there's any sector in disability that doesn't need improvement, whether it be on the side of the person with the disability, the family, or the person working in those services. It has to change yeah. for us all because at the end of the day, we're all on the one page here, or we're meant yeah. to all be on the one page. We're meant to all want what's best for the person who needs support. Um. And I, yeah, I just, it's just, it seems incredible to me that these people are, are, these staff are just often treated so badly. And that's why we see the turnaround. And I've spoken to some of them. Why would they stay somewhere where they can't maybe have security of being able to get a mortgage, where they can't have yeah. security of being yeah. able to purchase a car or where they can't pay their mm-hmm. rent every month? I mean, these people have commitments at home themselves. They have lives to live. Um Absolutely. This is my life, but it's their work and they need to be paid for their work. Absolutely. Well, Linda, we're going to have to cut it there. Unfortunately, I could stay talking to you all night. Um, yeah. Well, I couldn't because I'm after putting my hand up about three times behind me without just being <laughs> stopped and opening the door, so I better go. <laughs> but um, like you, yeah, we have to go. But Linda, thank you so much for taking the time. Um, Linda, um, Carol from Enough is Enough. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to Irish Public and Roundup tonight. And you're going to be on with us a lot more going forward. So thank you so much. Look forward to it. Linda, thank you so much indeed.